great honor for me to introduce to you Dr. Sayi to lecture to you because I don't want to spend too much time because he can give you a lecture, then ask any kind of questions around peace and around world area concerned, about issue concerned, from the traditional issue and the current issue. It is kind of a good honor for me to introduce you Dr. Sayi. Now it's time your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chang is generous, as usual, with his remarks, with his welcome, with his hospitality. It is, for me, a joy to be with you, and exchange with you thoughts, feelings, and talk about what we can do together. The focus for me this morning is Middle East. My work in my university is in peace and conflict resolution at the American University in Washington, D.C. We have a program. We offer BAs, MAs, and PhDs in peace and conflict resolution concentration within international relations, international politics. For me, thinking about the first thing that came to mind as Dr. Chang was talking about peace and then about the Middle East, I was reminded that on one level, you may say that information, the science of information, the art of information retrieval originated in the Middle East. For those among us who are biblical scholars, we remember in the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers, the Lord orders Moses to send out his men, and in those days it was men, sexism was rampant to send out his men to spy the land of Canaan and he did but in spite of the fact that information and its science originated in the Middle East solid information is hard to come by <laughs> when one talks about the Middle East when one thinks about it. Much of the discourse has become, has become surrounded with a great deal of miscommunication, misperception, misunderstanding. Yes. Talking about the Middle East, Peace is possible. Peace is possible. Yes. Peace is possible because Palestinians and Israelis are there to stay, both of them. They are both there to stay. Peace is possible because the security of the Palestinian depends on the security of the Israeli and the security of the Israeli is contingent upon the security of the Palestinian meaning Israeli security and Palestinian dignity go hand in hand. We can't have one without the other. Peace is possible because it has become clear after more than four decades that violence doesn't work. After four decades of violence, the Israelis are no closer to secure borders in 1989 than they were in 1948, which was the first war between Arabs and Israelis. And after more than four decades of violence, there are more Palestinians languishing in refugee camps in 1989 than, than we had in 1948. So that's why I'm saying to you, peace is possible. Peace is possible because we have come to realize that there are no alternatives. 
that there are no alternatives. But then the question today, since my topic is the peace process in the Middle East, is there a peace process in the Middle East? And I'm confining my remarks to the Israeli-Palestinian situation. You could ask later about Lebanon, we could talk about Lebanon. We could ask questions about Iran, Iraq, we could talk about that too. But focusing on the situation in the Holy Land, first, let me emphasize that there is no peace process today in the Holy Land. There is no peace process. On the level of relationships between the two principal parties, Israelis and Palestinians, not only there is no peace process, there is a process of harassment, of war, of violence. So on the level of the two principal parties to the conflict, that is what prevails at this time. Harassment, occupation, violence, counter-violence, on the level of the relationship between Arab states and Israel, leaving Egypt aside, because Egypt has signed with Israel a peace treaty. On the level of Arab states and Israel, peace process, again there doesn't exist. The whole issue of peace has low relevance because both sides, Arab governments and Israel, can live with the status quo. It is acceptable, it is manageable from the perspectives of those governments. On the level of Washington and Moscow, there is no recognition on the part of Washington that the Soviet Union should be a partner and a party to the peace process. And again, over there, there is no peace process. But things are changing, and hopefully you could come to that. Recent developments in Soviet-American relationship suggest that an important area for discussions is opening. So to go back then, to begin with the, with, with the first thought that I have on my mind, there is no peace process. There is no peace process between the Palestinians and the Israelis. No peace process between Arabs governments and Israel, other than Egypt, and no peace process on the part of Soviet Union and the United States. The second question then I want to raise with you, what are the requirements for a peace process at this time in 1989? What is needed really is for us to begin to, to develop images of peace. One of the things lacking when we think about Palestinians and Israelis, there is no image or there are no images of peace. How should peace look like? To have a peace process we need to begin to identify goals, objectives. Uh, we begin, we have to begin to identify indicators that, would, that we could use to assess as to whether or not we are moving in the right direction. So when we think of what is needed to have a peace process, requirement number one is to have, to have a 
some images of peace, to have some goals, to, to begin to think of objectives, to begin to think of indicators. What are some of the steps? Persons like myself and others who are involved in attempting to put life into a peace process. What I can do is share with you my perspective. For me, what is needed, among other things, are the following. Number one, recognition of the Palestine Liberation Organization. There cannot be a peace process unless the Palestine Liberation Organization is recognized is recognized as a partner in the peace process. Because if there is to be peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, there has to be recognition that the PLO represents the Palestinians. And perhaps during the question and answer period we could talk about that. Number two, there has to be a recognition of the Soviet Union as a, par a partner in the peace process. Now, earlier, I referred to the Soviet Union and in passing suggested that they have to be included. Times are changing. Those of us who speak with the Soviets have been telling them, look here, if you want to be included in the peace process, you have to, to demonstrate change on your part. Changes are occurring. Changes are occurring on the level of discussions between the Soviet Union and Israel. It is not altogether far-fledged that diplomatic recognition, diplomatic exchanges are going to occur between both sides. In more recent weeks, the Soviets have indicated to Washington a new flexibility, a changed attitude, that indeed they are, they are interested in becoming involved in the peace process, they have to be involved as partners. Three, to set up a, a United Nations special office responsible for the peace process, to set up a special office in the United Nations under the auspices of the superpowers and the great powers whose responsibility will be primarily that of focusing on peace between the Palestinians and Israelis. Now some of you may raise the question, should that be the international conference? Because there's a great deal of talk about having an international conference. It doesn't matter in a way if what is needed is an international conference, it could happen that way. But the reason I'm suggesting United Nations and special separate office under the auspices of the superpowers and the great powers, something that would be acceptable to the Israelis. Because the Israelis insist that any process has to have the guarantees, ironclad guarantees that it could work. But on the other hand, their size are also suspicious of the United Nations. So hence the notion of a separate office under the auspices of the superpowers and great powers may respond to that particular suspicion. Four, no party, no party, by that I mean Palestinians, Israelis, Syrians, Lebanese, because 
Negotiations have to include not only the Palestinians and the Israelis, but negotiations have to include those Arab states that have outstanding issues with the state of Israel. That parties to the dispute, to the conflict, go to the peace negotiation without preconditions, without demands for preconditions. Because those of us who, are, who work with conflict resolution have discovered the following. Anytime we are trying to resolve conflict, when A and B are trying to resolve conflict, and A and B go to the discussion with demands and conditions, that oftentimes preclude, precludes the discovery of other options that could become suggested in those discussions. So what, when I'm suggesting that we should go without conditions, that is the primary consideration. Number five, to include in the discussion talks about rights of Palestinians and rights of Israelis to settle in various parts of the Holy Land. What I'm suggesting here is that we should not continue to be locked into the perspective of states and territory and forgot, forget about people. We have to begin to think and talk about rights of people, not merely rights of states. That would be, that would be a, different, a different way, a different view. We have to be willing to talk about rights of people, not limit our discussions to rights of states. Because what happens, oftentimes, peoples become lost their right when we are locked in the rights of states. We go to the peace conference with several maps. We don't go with one map. We go with many maps. And number seven, we go to the conference with several institutional formulas for the limitation of sovereignty of both the Israelis and the Palestinians. That's sharing with you a thought, some thoughts about a peace process. Now I have a couple of questions to myself and of you. To myself, I'm asking the question, as someone who has lived in Washington for many, many years, now 36 years, and living with wars in the Middle East, as you know, and if you do not know, it's not for me to depress you, that in the Middle East today, governments spend between 20 to 30 percent of their gross national product on militarization, between 20 to 30 percent. that expenditures on arms alone in the Middle East this past year approximated 60 billion dollars. That the increase in expenditure on arms in the Middle East has been 10 about 10 percent a year. Ten years ago, Middle Eastern government spent less than $27 billion. Staggering. 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 
when governments do that, that is staggering. In the Middle East, in the decade of the 80s, in the decade of the 80s, more than one million people were killed. That's right. That's right. That's. So we are dealing with, with, with a situation that is tragic. That is tragic. So as we talk about where do we go from here, where do we go from here? Where we go from here, number one, is for the United States government to recognize that we Americans are not mere bystanders in the war and tragedy of Palestinians and Israelis, but in fact we are participants. See, oftentimes we Americans in Congress and in our discourse on television and in the newspapers, we talk and and behave as though we are merely innocent bystanders. Why can those Jews and Arabs get together and solve their problems in a Christian spirit? As one American diplomat commented many years ago. Number one, we Americans have to accept responsibility as participants in that tragedy. We arm that tragedy materially as well as with arms. Oh, the Soviets do too. I'm not, I'm not in any way letting the Russians go scot-free. In fact, when we think of wars and arms in the Middle East, unfortunately, even the Swiss government has been selling weapons in the Middle East. Such a neutral nation as Switzerland. There is hardly a nation that has not benefited from the tragedy of the Middle East. But I am here in the United States that we Americans, we are party to the conflict. We are not mere bystanders. That we are party to it. We are party to it in our legislation day to day, in the billions of dollars we provide, in the arms we transfer. We are. So we have a responsibility. It's not like we are innocent bystanders. It's not like we are saying, hey, we have nothing to do with it. I wish to God that you could get together. So it is the, the ball in your court. It is not. So what is needed on our part is that recognition that we are party to that conflict. That indeed we play a very important role. And as such we invite the Soviet Union we invite the Soviet Union to share with us those responsibilities because they too are party to the conflict. And invite the Soviet Union so that the Soviets will have stakes in stability in the Middle East. That's, that's pretty important. Specifically what we Americans can do is for the President of the United States to adopt a very bold position and to tell Israel, the Palestinians, and the other Arabs. This is what we Americans, as participants in this conflict, offer. Number one, we offer that 242 
Resolution B242 be amended. This is United Nations Resolution 242 to be amended. To be amended to include the following principles. Number one, to call for Palestinian self-determination. Number two, to call for negotiations under the auspices of the United Nations Security Council with a separate United Nations office sponsored by the superpowers and supported by the other three great powers. Three, recognition of the legitimacy of both parties to the conflict. That the Palestinians, the PLO, reassert its recognition of the state of Israel as the PLO did a few months ago and that the Israelis also acknowledge and recognize the legitimacy of the PLO because if you and I cannot recognize each other's legitimacy we cannot negotiate. If I think of you as non-existent and you think of me as unreal we can't negotiate. Number four, number four, for President Bush to declare a moratorium on violence in the Holy Land pending a peace settlement with the support of the Soviets. Moratorium on violence in the Holy Land during the process of negotiation. Number five, even more courageous and more bold for the government of the United States with the support of the Soviet Union to enforce, to enforce an arms freeze in the Holy Land. Both superpowers will agree there shall be no transfer of arms to the Holy Land to declare the Holy Land and hopefully the whole Middle East arms free so that mothers in the Middle East can feed their babies I have seen that with my own eyes mothers because of malnutrition cannot feed, breastfeed their infants because the budget and the resources of their land is going into purchasing weapons. In conclusion then, what can the Palestinians and the Israelis do? The question. They have to do a great deal of changing their own perceptions. Both sides. Both sides have to work hard at changing their own perceptions. The Palestinians have to understand and recognize the fear of the Israelis. And the Israelis have to understand and empathize with the anger of the Palestinians. For the Palestinians and the Arabs to understand that they can indeed alter the behavior of the Israelis and for the Israelis indeed to believe that they can alter the behavior of the Arabs. Part of the tragedy is neither side believes that it can affect a change in the attitude of the other side. When one speaks with Arabs, the Arabs are given no hope. And when one speaks with the Israelis, they tell you no hope, you can't trust the Arabs. So what happens here again between Arabs and the Israelis, there's a great deal of perceptual, perceptual conflict, perceptual confusion, perceptual gaps, 
that have to be dealt with. Because what happens oftentimes, Israelis and Palestinians feed each other's fear and anger. The Palestinians and Arabs feel the fear of the Israelis by conjuring images of the Holocaust or referring to Israeli behavior as Nazi behavior. That's the last thing an Arab should tell the Israeli because that raises the whole fear again. And for the Israeli to tell the Arab, you dumb Arabs, stereotyping Arabs as being untrustful, you can't trust them. That has to change. Because Israelis have to recognize that the Arabs have legitimate basis for their anger, And the Arabs have to understand that the Israelis have legitimate basis for their fears. They both have to begin to humanize one another. We have to move from indignation to a rehumanization. Because what happens in enemy situation, we dehumanize one another. We cease to view one another as people. That's for... So number one, for this is for Palestinians and Israelis, for Arabs and Israelis to begin to narrow the perceptual gap between them. Now the question becomes, how about you here, sitting here, us? Well, what can you do? Well, you have done it already. You are interested in knowing. That's great. Learning more. Opening ourselves up to know more. But we can do more than that. We can, we can communicate to our government in Washington to stop doing violence in the Middle East. We can do that. Because every time we transfer a bullet, we are doing violence. It is tragic Sometimes we Americans are not aware of the violence that we are responsible for in the region. And finally, what can we all do together? Because after all, we are all involved in this. All of us here are the heirs of an order of violence and conflict in the Middle East. And I mean all of us. Us Americans, Arabs, Israelis, Russians, and I speak to the Russians too since they are not here. We are heirs of violence and conflict. We are heirs of an order of violence and, and conflict. Let us beginning with now to commit ourselves to become architects, architects of a new order of justice and peace in the region. Justice and peace. It's in our hands. It is in our hands. And ask ourselves the question, can the lure of Isaiah when, and again, those were sexist days, when men shall dig their source into plowshares, and I, sh I should add, when women and men dig their source into plowshares. Let us make that lure of Isaiah a reality, that instead of the source, we have the plowshares, and let the Middle East blossom again as it did, as it was, as it has been. And let it not be said about us, particularly those of us here who either come from the land of revelation or who are 
participants in the Abrahamic tradition of the land of revelation, let it not see, be said about us that we could not see the light upon our own path. And for me personally, for me personally, as someone who was born in Syria and someone who is part of the Arab culture and someone who is part of the American civilization and someone who is part of the planet. What I won't say to you is to ask myself the question has the land where the first brother killed his brother has that land learned since the beginning of time? And my answer is yes, we have learned. Yes, we have learned. We have learned that in peace we can thrive and in violence we become destroyed. Thank you for having me with you. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to express my thoughts before you. And I want to thank Dr. Chang again for making it possible for me to be here. Because this is an enterprise that all of us are affected by and every one of us can make a difference. That's what I want to conclude with, that indeed every single person here, every single one of us is a chosen person. Every single one of us is a chosen person who can deal with the great issues that are confronting us. And every one of us can make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you. I think the uh, Dr. Sai speech gives a most comprehensive formula. Issues advice for the uh, peace process in the Middle East because it's based on humanism, justice, and uh, the uh, uh, eternal, uh, eternal peace. So I think not only Dr. Sai suggests the government, the people of all the world uh, is participant. We in this classroom, we are all the participants. I think we well, thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can ask Dr. Sayi to answer you. Thank you. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, PLO uh, does lead to an understanding between the Israelis and the Palestinians. What effect, uh, how, how can that affect the foreign policy of, of all the other Arab countries, notably uh, Libya and Syria uh, and Iraq, uh, not to mention Iran? Uh, if if uh, war is to be continued, continue to be the settled foreign policy of those countries, what hope is there that a peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis will endure? That is definitely one of the challenges facing any peace process in the region. Uh, my, this, m my experience of your question takes me in two directions. One would be to say that half a loaf is better than a whole loaf, meaning that whatever small steps we could take, for me, are better than most steps, and specifically between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But to go to the broader question that you have raised, in the case of Libya, we need to be concerned less about Libya. The situation has changed dramatically with Libya in terms of Libyan role in international relations, many factors, uh, declining oil revenues in Libya, inclining opposition to Gaddafi, uh, isolation of Gaddafi by the Arab states. Uh, I think 
in a realistic sense, we can worry less, be concerned less about Libya. Now your question, however, becomes valid too about how about Libyan support of violence by Palestinians who are opposed to Arafat. Because again, I, uh, I spent a week with Arafat recently, a group of us uh, who are in peace and conflict resolution, conducting workshops on nonviolence. And this, what many people fail to grasp about the PLO, the PLO is a confederation. It's a loose confederation. Uh, on good days, as Arafat put it, he is able to exercise influence with 60 or 70 percent of the PLO. On bad days, who knows? And on bad days, there are other members of the PLO with whom, over whom he has little or no influence. So the, your question becomes germane about Gaddafi inciting violence by certain Palestinians who are opposed to the PLO. Uh, but I think the likelihood of that is declining too. Your question about Syria, uh, Syria has to be a party to the peace process. Uh, Syria has made it clear that they will sit in a peace process uh, and that they will accept, they will accept an international conference. So the answer there depends on what happens. Uh, as a state, they have committed themselves that they will do that. Uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Iraq, again, uh, Iraq yesterday, uh, two days ago, started coming up with some ideas about a peace plan. Uh, Iraq could be a spoiler, because Iraq is not directly involved in the peace process. Uh, Iraq could also support violence by certain Palestinians who are opposed to, the, to the leadership of the PLO, possible. That's something to be concerned with. Um, but again, Iraq receives its arms from the Soviet Union, and their Soviet leverage is important. Iran, uh, conditions are changing in Iran. Iran is hurting pretty badly. In fact, today I was supposed to be in Tehran. On one level, it was my choice between Mansi and Tehran. There's a conference that began this morning. I have been traveling so much. I just came back from Istanbul, Turkey. I just <laughs> couldn't <laughs> go back again. But there is a conference today in Tehran focusing on how relationships can begin to open with the West. Yeah. Uh, but these are challenges. You are right. They have challenges that have to be considered. Oh, Saudi Arabia has been pretty flexible and supportive of uh, a peace process. But to go back to what I said earlier in my presentation, that government can live with the situation, whereas Palestinians and Israelis, I mean, I'm talking about the Palestinian and the Israeli, it's hard, it's, it's, for them to live, to live with the situation of fear, harassment, intimidation on both sides uh, is one that is becoming less and less bearable. Please go ahead. Yeah. My question is, uh, I would like to go a step back, what he was referring to. How did the Palestinians become unrecognized in the first place? If a guy who lives in France or born in France, he's called a French. So when we refer to Palestinians, where is this land? Where did it go? Just because you occupy a land does not mean that you start believing those people as non-existent or unrecognized. So where did this land go? Well, not, uh, you know, the, the history of that, what happened, after 1948, with the 1948 war, the Palestinians lost more land than what was assigned to them by the United Nations and more than what was given to the newly established state of Israel. In the 67 war, they lost the rest of it, Gaza, West Bank, the rest of Jerusalem. What had happened in a way, and didn't have a chance to talk about this. What began, what began as a conflict, a political conflict between the state of Israel and Arab states, uh, beginning with 1967, expanded to also become an intercommunal conflict. And that's what has complicated the conflict. When Israel became an occupation power, 
Uh, then what began as a state interstate conflict became intercommunal. The land disappeared. The land disappeared. The land of the Palestinians became occupied by the Israelis. And Jerusalem became the capital of Israel. Meaning the Israeli government decided that. In my conversations with Arafat, with Abu Iyad, with Khadoumi and other leaders of the PLO. Bear in mind again a couple of things about the PLO that is not usually underscored. P number one, the PLO is probably one of the relatively speaking most democratic institutions in the Middle East. By that I mean there's, there's give and take, there's discussion, there's leeway, there are agreements and disagreements. Uh, number two, the PLO leadership has, has, um, has announced that it recognizes Israel as a state, it renounces violence against civilians, it renounces terrorism. The Israelis will say, but we don't believe them. Well, that becomes another issue. There has to be mutual faith. Then the Israelis will say, look at the violence practiced by Abu Nidal. Well, Abu Nidal and Arafat do not communicate. Well, then the Israelis will say, but that's not our problem. The point I'm making there is that the leadership of the PLO, uh, I am convinced personally that after 1982, after what happened in Lebanon to the PLO, it took the leadership of the PLO maybe about five years by 87, and I have been working, I have been conducting interviews as well as discussions. By 1987, they became convinced that the way, the direction for peace has to be recognition, mutual recognition. What is happening, however, as we are now beginning to get closer to having a peace process, what a peace process means, it means that the Israelis eventually would have to give up territory. And hence, there is no discussion now. Because it's becoming increasingly evident that what a peace process means, little or no cost to the Palestinians, but high cost for the Israelis, meaning little or no cost for the Palestinians, the Palestinians will get. Or the cost for them, of course, has, will be, has been, from their viewpoint, recognition of Israel, etc. But the cost for the Israelis, from the viewpoint of the Israelis, is high to give up land that has been occupied. That may explain the reluctance of the Israelis or the reluctance of the Shamir government. To be fair again, the reluctance of Likud and to be fair again, not so much the Labour Party. Not to... to to stall, to delay, to postpone, knowing the, the peace process, knowing that any peace process requires that they give up something. That's, that's a tough one. If, I, if no question, please go ahead. Yeah, of course. It might clarify the last questioner to realize that uh, all those Arabs who stayed in the uh, land which is now part of Israel became citizens of the state of Israel. So they are recognized as citizens just as anyone else in, in the state of Israel. You are referring, uh, you are referring to Palestinians living in Israel. Yes. Yeah, yeah. living in Israel. Yeah. And, and secondly, Israeli as citizens. far as uh, Palestinians being non-existent, the, re the reason the Arab, the Israelis have possession of the occupied uh, lands is because there was a war. And there's never been a peace conference to resolve the uh, uh, that war. So, uh, I, I'm not clear on this, but wasn't it Jordan who had uh, governance over this occupied the West area? Bank, the West Bank and Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah. No, no. So uh, it was under Jordan, and do I understand Jordan has given up on that? Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, there going back to your comment on Palestinians living in Israel, they carry Israeli passports. They have the rights of citizenship, but limited, limited rights. Yeah. Well, they uh, have uh, 
the they have representation, but the rights are limited uh, in a number of ways. But they do carry Israeli passports. They are Israeli okay, well. Now, if you speak with them, as I do, uh, with persons living in Israel, uh, they accept their situation, but they are asking for revisions in their status uh, to be given equal rights, equal opportunities. Uh, they are not given equal opportunities in education, uh, in many other areas. So that's part of the question. As the other part of your question, uh, yes, the, uh, the wars of 48 and 73, uh, I'm sorry, and 67, alter the maps. The question, part of the question that came from there, take part of the issue right now. The Palestinians living in East Jerusalem, Jerusalem is considered to be part of Israel. It's by the Israelis, the capital of Israel. However, there are Palestinians living in East Jerusalem who are not Israeli citizens. Those people do not enjoy any citizens' rights. In fact, one of the issues right now is whether or not they can vote in the d proposed election. And the Israelis have said, no, they cannot vote in the proposed election. So one has to refer to the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem and the Palestinians living in other parts of the West Bank, as well as Gaza, uh, they do not have rights uh, at this time since the beginning of the Intifada. They are practicing, uh, they are practicing resistance to Israeli occupation. Uh, some of the resistance is violent, maybe about 15%, and I'm referring to the petrol bombs and to the stones, but 85% of the resistance is total non-violence. It, it includes boycotts, refusal to pay taxation, uh, the development of parallel organizations, and in fact uh, what is occurring with the Intifada is one of the examples of non-violence that is being emulated or attempts are made to emulate that in many parts when we met Arafat since Professor, Professor Jean Sharp from Harvard and myself are pretty much involved with nonviolence he asked Arafat asked Jean Sharp he said he said Professor Sharp how much of the intifada is nonviolent and Jean Sharp who makes a study of nonviolence he said about 15 percent is violent 85 percent is nonviolent uh, Arafat said he was I mean he was serious in asking the questions because what we were trying to tell the Palestinians Sharp and myself, Gene Sharp, is that nonviolence is more effective as a strategy with the Palestinians than violence because nonviolence practiced by the Palestinians would render Israeli violence ineffective. As we explained to them, what is happening in responses to the to uh, the Intifada? What I think, what part of what has happened? I traveled a great deal in the United States. Many Americans, it took the Intifada for many Americans to discover, including many American Jews, that Israel is an occupation, an occupation power. They didn't know this. I mean, suddenly it became clear to people here that Israel is an occupation power. And part of what altered perspectives in the United States, and perspectives continue to change, have been the scenes on television of Israeli soldiers uh, beating up, breaking arms, uh, and uh, other means of physical violence in retaliation against the Palestinians, some of them throwing stones, others not throwing stones, and the situation has become much more complicated. Yeah, please, go ahead, yeah. Is, uh, we didn't hear recently about uh, the, uh, what they call it, the Palestinian state at the West Bank. So what's your opinion so, about that? Uh, if you want to ask me about my image of peace uh, is one that emphasizes a two-state solution. 
an Israeli state, the state of Israel, and a Palestinian state. Uh, this is acceptable to the PLO, acceptable, I would say, to many segments of the PLO at this time. Uh, unacceptable to the Israelis. The Israelis do not accept a two-state solution. Even among Israeli, well, when I say the Israelis, to be fair, Likud, the dominant position of the Shamir government. More than 50%, depending on the pools you are looking at, of Israelis are willing to exchange land for peace. Uh, many are willing to accept a state. Uh, others talk about self-determination, autonomy, but to answer your question directly, Personally, I don't think that there is an alternative to a state, to a two-state solution. But let me go a bit further. This would be new for some of you here, not for others. Uh, Arafat and his immediate leadership, granted, not, not everyone agrees with Arafat, because let me emphasize again, there are members of the appeal who disagree with them, went further and said in discussions public with those of us who have been meeting with him and we keep close connection in the sense that we exchange, we ask him questions, those of us who are non-violence. Arafat said, look here, I accept a state and I think we the Palestinians will accept a state and if the Israelis want to have a confederation with us, we'll accept a confederation. Yeah. And then that Jerusalem became a federal federal city for both of us. He has said that. Now, those statements of Arafat do not have access to airtime <laughs> as some of the other statements. Now, many people say, well, does he mean it? My response to that, as a po someone who is trained as a political scientist and have been working with it for 31 years now, none of us can gauge the sincerity <laughs> of political leaders. However, we can practice our analysis. And my analysis tells me that he does. That Arafat and the leadership of the PLO, what he was saying, he said, look, if we have two states, I will enter a confederation, but I will enter a confederation only from a position, from a position of what? Of having a state. Uh, then we can talk about a federal city in Israel. Then we can also talk, Arafat has said, about Israelis and Palestinians living in different Israelis living in different parts of the West Bank. Uh, some people have been talking about the idea of cantons, like in Switzerland, that there could be cantons. I have a feeling that at this time, and maybe I will conclude with this, that at this time nothing short of a bold, a bold diplomatic position on the part of President Bush can begin the peace process. Nothing else could do it. Indications thus far are that the Bush administration is pretending to to try to create a peace process. I say to you, as of today, 20th November, there are no signs other than pretensions if Bush, President Bush, were to make a bold move, I believe it can happen. And I believe the Soviets are ready to follow. I really believe that. I, I, I honestly believe it. And this is, that's why I'm pretty optimistic. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah.